My name is Zoran Stamer. I'm the CEO of Core Media, and I have the great pleasure to welcome you here at the NRF show um, together with, with Nick, Nick Smotek. Hello. Nick is uh, with Decas Brands, and um, yeah, I have to say I'm kind of like blown away. Oh, this is great. <laughs> As I said, AV is hard. Um, I was blown away when I got to know Nick because Nick was able to deliver an experience with our technology for, in that case, Salesforce Commerce Cloud in such a short time. And the way they basically selected our solution, the way they negotiated the contract within less than a week, and the way they delivered the first live experience was just mind-blowing. I virtually haven't seen that before. So I was like uh, trying to figure out what is Nick's secret, because a lot of companies want to be agile. Actually, all of them want to be agile. Nobody says, I have too much time, uh, please make it slower. It's like always, you have to be faster. And um, so I asked Nick if he was willing to join us here uh, at the show and talk about his experience uh, at Decker's Brands. Um, in the last few months, he brought multiple uh, brands live uh, with Comedia and, and Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Um, so it's not just one side, uh, but multiple. And he has big plans for the future. And as soon as... Um, the AV works, we would be able to look at something I would like to share with you before we start uh, to hear from Nick. The observation we have working for multiple brands, especially luxury brands, is that you know, there is a big difference between being a normal brand and being an iconic brand. So there's so much stuff out there, so many opportunities, so many options to choose from as a customer it is hard to make that selection. Usually, you take what is memorable, what you know already. So you go for something iconic, something that is in your memory that you can remember. And uh, so being iconic is um, a big difference. Oh, I'm not sure we are at the, at the right slide. Maybe we are. Could I have a clicker or, or move forward? Well, maybe stay, stay at this slide for a moment. So being iconic is the difference that makes a difference because otherwise you don't get any attention. And um, as soon as you have an iconic brand, suddenly things get much easier. Just think of um, the Kardashians. It's an iconic brand in, in the US, the Kardashian family. And um, the youngest billionaire, the self-made billionaire in the world is one of the Kardashians, right? So basically uh, Kylie Jenner, she started her own brand using the Kardashian brand, and she sold uh, lipsticks and, and a lot of other uh, products. And the products can't be really the difference that makes a difference, because other people sold lipsticks as well. But to become a billionaire, she needed a, an iconic brand, and that's what she did. When you think about Tesla, Tesla doesn't sell any, any uh, it doesn't market their cars in an old-fashioned way. There are no dealerships, they don't do marketing like we know, they don't basically pay for advertisement. But what they do is they shoot, or Elon Musk shoots rockets into the air and has this old Tesla uh, Roadster flying in a, like close to Mars and around the sun for the next million years. So that is a kind of storytelling that is very different, but that everyone knew because we love to talk about these things. Yeah, um, Decker's brand, as you can see here, is multiple brands. Um, the first one that they implemented was UGG, Com, the nice boots, but right now, and, and we will hear, hear from, from Nick, they rolled it out to multiple other brands. Could you move forward, please? So um, we are too far. We have to go back, I think. There should be a slide with this. Yeah, that one. So that was the only thing I would like to share with you before we hear from Nick the details. Um, what we learned from um, the brands is that there is some kind of maturity model that you can decide where are you today and where you want to be in the future. A lot of the companies we interact with at the beginning, they have an experience that is more fragmented. So in a way, they have a nice looking website, but you can't buy anything. And you want to buy something, you have to go to the online store. That is not as nice looking, but you can buy everything with one click. When you have a service interaction, it's again, a different website, a different service. And you can tell, by just looking at the thing, is that done by marketing, by merchandising, by support? Because the org chart is visible in your customer experience. 
From there, the next level up is you integrate content over all these touch points so that you have like, yeah, more like an online flagship store instead of a website and a store. The next level up is that you do that not just for one country, but you do it for, let's say, 100 countries, for not just one language, but 20, maybe 40 languages. And you do it not just for one touch point, the mobile or the web, or, but you do it for multiple touch points, more and more touch points that are integrated, your emails, your social media. The next level up that we often see is that then you start to personalize the experience or to, to make it dynamic. Like, you know, you are, it's raining where you are, and then, you know, you have the latest mobile phone from Apple, like the Macs, and so therefore, the experience should adjust to your interest and to your situation that you're in. So that is all this contextualizing of the experience. And the last step that we expect to see soon, we work with some clients on that, is an immersive experience. The idea is there is no separation between physical and digital anymore. First of all, we all have these phones with us all the time, so the digital part, we take it around with us. But also, you see these screens popping up everywhere. Like New York Times, New York is full of the big billboards. You see it in more and more of the, uh, of the um, you know, walking by at the, at the flagship stores. They have more and more screens. And nowadays, you did could basically have the whole flagship store be one big screen on the wall. And it becomes possible to use these screens much more interactive. So we play it out globally, but also using voice technology or scanning technology to do something with these screens. And um, when you think about the amount of money that these uh, luxury uh, brands spend for the best real estate and the nicest streets around the world, that is a lot of money. Adding a screen, like for one side of that store, that can be used to play out attractive content all the time, day and night, personalized, that is a very slow investment. The problem in the past was it was hard to manage that content for these screens, and that is uh, going away. So what we see at the next level is that indeed you come to a store and the store knows about your appointment and basically creates screens fit with content just for you. The stuff that you want to basically visit, you want to see the products in your language with your currency. That will be possible uh, in the near future. So physical and digital will be one. So now I'd like to hand over to Nick and hear more insights on the real world like Nick did it. Um, he's director for... Um, for, what is it, tech? Digital technology. Digital technology, which is basically, yeah, all of that, and customer experience. So there's hardly anything that doesn't fit in that description. And thank you. Nick, please. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, Nick Smotek, I'm the director of digital technology and user experience. Uh, I've been doing e-commerce now and retail for about 15 years. Um, I've started out really early in my career as, as a web developer and then kind of moved into software engineering. And, and then now I'm kind of taking over the entire e-commerce website stack for uh, Decker's brands. Um, next slide, please. Um, so like um, it, we mentioned here, uh, we have five brands and websites um, under the Decker's um, eco, um, yeah, in, umbrella. Hoka 1-1 being a performance lifestyle running brand. Teva Footwear, the first sports marketing, uh, sports sandal out there on the market. And Sanook, um, Sook, Sanook is a lifestyle brand, like um, mostly around like flip-flops and going to the beach and hanging out with your friends in, the, uh, uh, in your backyard and barbecuing and stuff like that. And then our most iconic brand is UGG, which is a fashion lifestyle brand. And, and then the uh, smaller brand that's kind of very similar, but Coolerboro, which is a sister brand to UGG brand. So next slide. Um, so we have put together to deliver content um, quickly to the market. Um, we call them our go-to-market teams, right? We have two teams, one focused on our performance lifestyle brands, and then one, one group focused on our fashion lifestyle brands. And what we did is we put together marketers, SEO people, email, developers, designers, all together on one team. They meet daily on an agile kind of methodology. And their job is solely just to deliver our go-to-market strategy on a daily basis. So having everybody together that can write the copy, design it, and um, has really al allowed us to accelerate our process and get um, content to um, our websites as quickly as possible. Um, next slide, please. We also have small teams across the globe. We have a small go-to-market team that sits in our Europe office and our Asia-Pacific office. 
And a lot of the times they'll take what we have done in the US market and copy and paste that into their e-commerce stack. And so that's kind of why we started, between all this, we started looking out, trying to figure out ways to just optimize this. And, and to get content out to market was taking us like a week to two weeks from conception to end. So we wanted to remove all the bottlenecks and really empower our marketers and merchandisers to really deliver content out there. Um, as quickly as possible. And partnering with Core Media, we were able to reduce that down to days and hours in some situations. Um, and we've really allowed our developers and our designers to really focus on creating new templates for the system so that the marketers and that can really repurpose everything over and over again and create really good branded experiences for our site. So uh, freeing our time up with Core Media has really allowed us to focus on telling really good stories on the websites. Next slide, please. So our goal when we partnered with them was really to just become really relevant in the moment, um, you know, with micro moments out there and, and personalization, right? We wanted to be able to share our content between regions, um, improve our speed to market and our process. Um, our process was really cumbersome in the beginning um, and we've really streamlined that down. We had Excel spreadsheets that would outline how the marketing plan was going to go, um, and that would get briefed to a designer, and then the designer would then take it, then it would go through an approval process, then it would go to a developer, and that whole process would take um, upwards to two to two weeks, sometimes even longer, depending on the marketing campaign. And now we've really empowered the merchandiser in the beginning just to create the content on the websites right off the bat, and then go through a small approval process that would get it approved for the, for the to go into the real into the into the real world, I, I would say. So. And partnering with Cormita, we were able to use a headless, headless, um, headless CMS and be able to get that out in real time. And we can make changes to the websites within 15 minutes sometimes. So, um, next slide. So, but this has allowed us to really start experimenting with different types of stories on the websites. Um, we're, we really started targeting, like, we started doing some experiments with A-B testing on weather-based um, components, so showing boots in, um, for snow products when it's snowing for the consumer in the market, being able to tell our stories, our philanthropy stories in better ways, and really infusing the entire e-commerce experience with the storytelling that we're trying to do. Storytelling f is going to be what sets brands apart from other retailers like Amazon and stuff like that because you go to Amazon and there's not a whole lot of richness to the stuff. So coming to the brand is what people are experiencing and they really want to engage with the brand and learn more about it um, and really see how it is and uh, how to wear it, how to ex how the experience of it is and, and stuff like that. So um, next slide. So really what we so when we started looking at all this, we saw that a basic blog that we had on our site for years really had a lot of high engagement. People spent more time on the site. They converted higher. We had higher AOV on everybody that went to the blog. So we started experimenting, bringing all that content throughout the websites on the PDPs, on the PLPs. And what we saw is that we increased our add to cart rate significantly and we increased our conversion pretty heavily. So we started experimenting with that a lot more and it's been really successful for us over the years. So next slide, please. And stuff like, telling your story from the homepage through to the experience like and showing lifestyle images on the PDP, engaging with the blog content um, has just been really successful for us. And so in 2019, our vision kind of next is, next slide please. Our vision really is for the 2019 is just to deliver relevant content in the moment wherever we can trying to engage with the micro moments of the consumer, what to wear on a Friday night, with boots to wear with, right, uh, to, to wear with what outfits, what, what shoes to wear for the next running event that you might be attending, how to train properly for the event. These, these are things that we're gonna be able to focus our content delivery versus building that content like it, from a development point of view. And then trying to personalize the website as wherever we can, you know, showing men's products um, when a man, when we, we we think that you're a man on the website or a woman, and and showing kids products when we think that is relevant, and right, and really just infusing that branded experience throughout the entire e-commerce experience on the website. So that's all I have right now. <laughs> Good, Nick. Thanks. Yeah. So we have some time to do a conversation. Um, please feel free if you have questions to uh, join in. Um, I hope there will be someone 
uh, giving you a mic or something. Nick, um, you mentioned the, the difference between the brand side and what the brand does, storytelling, from what Amazon does. And today, but you are available on both platforms, right? I, I can go to Amazon and buy Arc Boots. Yeah, um, we kind of compete with ourselves. Right, right. <laughs> and, so. and so the difference is you tell a different story. So any insights about the customer who come to you and don't buy on Amazon? Because everyone should know these days that you could get the products on Amazon, right? Um, yeah, and I think the, the people that come to our websites are looking for that experience to understand what the product's more about, um, who we are as a, as a company, and, and how we in, engage in, with um, everyday life um, and what our vision is for everything. Amazon is really like new people who might not know who you are that are looking for boots, just like basic boots or something like that, and they're kind of a discovery um, um, of that, but um, a lot of times people are trying to come to our sites to just really understand who the brand is. And, and we try to get the content, the experience content into Amazon as well? Um, no, we don't. We, uh, we, we are, um, they're a wholesaler for us, and so we, we don't really try to compete there. So. Interesting. So when the people come to you, the impact of the story, have you, do you have any measures for that? Could you tell? You mentioned the blog, that when you, people basically use the blog, that that is very effective to get them to transact. Yeah, um, yeah we see uh, maybe about a 20% conver conversion lift um, when people engage with our blog content. Mm -hmm. um, and they spend more time on the websites, upwards to two to three minutes more and longer on the website. So learning more about the brand, engaging with us, and um, yeah, discovering. And, and, and then they ultimately usually convert at a higher AOV for us. So. Oh, okay, you see that too. Yeah. Interesting. And so that means it makes sense to build, to build more content, right? You said you empower the marketeers to be faster at that, and that is the basis for all the other things like uh, A-B testing, is that? Yeah. yeah, so with a lot of content comes a lot of time, right? So um, being able to test as much as we, we, we want, it really takes a lot of effort to create more content, right? And so making that as easy and seamless as possible so you can really A-B test out different messaging, mm -hmm. um, different placements of buttons very quickly um, is very key for us. So. Yeah. And the integration with your stores, your basically physical stores, is there basically, I, can, I guess I can pick up at the store and buy online, I can return to the store. Is there more also like a storytelling integration? Um, we would like to get to that point, right? Um, right now we have a full BOPIS, return online, pick up in store, um, buy online, pick, uh, pick up in store. A lot of our inventory could possibly come from a store. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really trying to integrate the store experience into the website as much as possible. So the vision to have the same campaign being implemented in the store and on the mobile is something you would... Uh, we would like to strive to get to, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And the, the story about multi-language, is that a topic? We saw that even in, in Germany that, um, you know, health insurance companies started to have seven different languages. Even though Germany was not an immigration country, right. now, like 25% of the, of the population has an, an immigration in, a background. So they realized, oh, it's a good idea to talk their language, to speak their language and to, to relate to them. So is that a topic for you as well? Um, yeah, we have plans to um, translate more of our websites. We're currently redoing a lot of our Europe websites, and they'll be offered in um, a, a, the four languages, and we'll, trans we'll bring that to the probably the U.S. website eventually. So. Yeah. So we have a customer in the Middle East, and they had uh, just English and dollars as the transaction platform, and then they started to introduce local language plus local currency. So they saw a 50% lift in revenue right away. The, oh, right after yeah. they relaunched with the local currency. So that's interesting. Yeah. I definitely could see that. So the, the other topic that I find fascinating is how did you get to this agile mode of doing things? Because from us, from our perspective, we haven't seen that before. Someone you know, contacting us to, to negotiate a contract and signing basically five days later and then implementing the next, next seven weeks without even a partner. You did it with your own team. So for us, a lot of companies struggle with that agility. Yeah. They struggle in multiple places, right? The contracting part, the supply chain, but also their own setup team. Yeah. What's the trick? Well, it took us a couple of years to kind of get away from the waterfall mentality. Um, and for a while, we called it scrum fall, where we actually had like a kind of a waterfall mentality for a little while on top of our agile methodology. And we've 
we really tried to go down a scrum process, but that we've modified so much because we really don't really follow a true agile process. But for us, it's really just having cross-functional people together that can do the, everything that you need working day to day, hand in hand. And if, if you can't have that, you run into too many roadblocks of what you need to do to get it done. So when we went with Core Media, we literally put together a, like a hit squad that was focused completely on just implementing the, the CMS. So, but, but the multiple different people, like there's a marketeer in there, there's someone from merchandising in there. So yeah. And then the designers, the developers. So that's like really like the cross-functional team that you set up for something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's key is having each discipline in there that you need to accomplish the task. So. And then how do you measure the success for those teams? Um, with this, w our, our goal for measuring success was how fast we can get to market, um, reducing our time from weeks to days was, was one of our basic success, success measurements. And then being able to just like change things in real time was, was, was huge for us. So. Okay, really that time, like how quickly can I have an idea and basically roll that out to the customer? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, or changing in markets. A lot of times we'll see products start to sell really quickly and we'll want to un initialize and, and move that to the homepage and take, it, take advantage of it being hot. Yeah, so it's interesting. Like we have other customers who said, okay, they don't even sell that much uh, online. They had like five to ten percent, but it was important for them because they said they learned faster. They learned faster of what is the trending in the market and what do they need to produce more. Also for the other retail partners. Yeah, is that something you do these days? Me, not personally, um, but um, yes, we do. We look at that, try to see, um, see how we can get take advantage of the market. Um, we're really trying to reduce our, our product development time you know, because in, when you're making footwear, it's really long process to get footwear out there and you can miss trends and stuff pretty quickly. So yeah. the goal is to try to take some of the agile methodologies that we do online here and bring that to our footwear product um, development life cycle and try to reduce that down from like, I don't know, it's like 19 months to you know it's a year or less than that would be great. And that's interesting. And then you can react right now, for example, like different colors. If something, you know the Kardashians again, they tweet something about this cool kind of paranoid purple, and then you can react faster already, or is it? We're getting there, I think, definitely. Changing colors on a product is a lot easier than it is right. actually redesigning a whole shoe, but um, that, that's the goal, is being able to change colors out quickly and get it through the whole you know, development of a product life cycle. Yeah. And, and the next steps is you want to do more of that. You want to basically create more content to? Yeah, um, we want to, the next steps that we want to hook up our DMP so that we can start really getting deeper into personalization um, and, and creating more content and really doing a discovery of what content people are trying to find in the moments and yeah. build more of that. Interesting. And personalization, do you have acceptance of your customers? They, they love it, they like it, they expect it, or? The personalization that we've done, the tests that we've done have been pretty successful. So showing weather, you know, weather specific products when it's snowing for people has been really successful for us. We've been doing that off and on for a few years now. Yeah. And then that's been really successful. And then um, personalization of product recommendations and all that's mm -hmm. been really successful. And so we want to take it to the next level of like you land on the homepage if we can identify you in any way, really start to personalize that experience throughout. Okay. So you mentioned you also have content that is relevant after the sell, right? Things like, uh, oh, after a while you get a little kind of like some dirt on your Uggs and you want to you know, clean that up. And you have these like content pieces about that situation. Yeah. How to clean your Uggs. Right. Yeah, so. so in a way that there would be, so you could put that on your, on your store, on your effective store online at the right timing, right? When people kind of might run into that. Totally. Yeah, that would be a, a good way to do it. Or if they're Googling, like, how to clean their products, you know, being able to serve that content out, you know. Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, and the, the question with um, into the store, what is, what is missing for that to happen, to go into the physical store with your content? Um, I think what's missing right now is some TVs in our stores. Um, so we're, we've, been re redesigning some of our stores, and I think they're, they're you know, trying to put TVs in the stores would be a big of a thing. Um, an app would be really good so that you could like maybe like see when someone comes in the store and start displaying up content and knowing who they are would be really neat. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just really just now that we have a CMS in place, just taking the steps to kind of execute on it. Yeah. Great. So I would like open up for questions over there. 
The question was, uh, what did you have before Comedia and why did you choose Comedia? Um, we're a Salesforce Commerce Cloud platform, and so we use the built-in Salesforce Commerce Cloud um, CMS, which is pretty limited. It's basically an HTML input. Um, so we had developers that would build content. They had templates that they would reuse and populate, but it was kind of a, a system that wasn't sustainable long-term to go faster. So. And why did you? Um, we picked Core Media. Um, we went, we looked, I was looking at CMSs for a couple of years here and there. And, um, what stood out to me about Core Media was the, the ease of it was for a merchandiser, someone that once it's all set up, can go in there and drag and drop and build out their content pretty quickly. And so and the learning curve for a merchandiser, a non-technical user was really easy, so. Uh, great. Yeah. More questions? The um, question was a virtual fitting and, and a virtual reality. I mean, we've definitely thought about it um, and haven't really gotten deep down in the exploration of it, but fitting for shoes is really a, definitely a uh, hot topic. Um, any way we can try to reduce returns would be really good. So, I mean, I think it would be something to experiment with um, in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I. I don't know if the technology uh, that I've seen is really there yet. I've seen some apps where you try to put, you know, different shoes on your feet and it's kind of weird. But um, <laughs> if once the technology is there, I definitely think it would be something to experiment with and, and explore. So. More questions? Please. So it's a low frequency uh, category. So what kind of science do you use for personalization? Um, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we haven't really, I mean, I haven't really done a lot of that um, with, with specifically to fashion other than um, that we're really trying to take like past purchase history, um, you know, what you've looked at before. Um, and, and trying to serve as relevant of products to, to the consumer when they come back with, especially within our loyalty program when we know what you repurchased, what you purchased in the past and stuff, or what categories you really like to look at. So if you've looked at certain categories and, or purchased like certain types of wedges or anything that, then we'll try to personalize that kind of content up to you. Um, basket within the category pages too, and changing the, the content there, and then um, and uh, even on the home page we'll change content and stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Then I would like to thank you, Nick, and thank you everybody for the. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the Comedia presentation, the live one, around the corner, 10 meters to the right, there is a live show. <laughs>